principles of Global Alliance. Um, our first speaker is Mark Caulfield, uh, and I always hate it when people say people don't need any introduction. So um, I, I've actually found it really interesting to look at what all of our speakers have done um, prior to getting sucked into the world of genomics. And um, Mark is a great expert in the molecular genetics of hypertension. Um, and actually, prior to his role as the chief, scientific, uh, chief scientist for Genomics England, um, led the National Institute for Health Research Cardiovascular Biomedical Research Unit. That sounds like very long. Um, but really, when I've actually had a look at his amazing track record um, in hypertension, He's really a leader in that field and now obviously a great leader in Genomics England. So over to you, Mark. We all want national initiatives just like yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be able to share with you where we are in the 100,000 Genomes Project and correlate that and link it in to the work of the Global Alliance. We're very proud to be members of the Global Alliance and we will look where possible to adopt the standards that will allow us uh, to make our program better. So the 100,000 Genomes Project is quite well known now. It was a health service transformation program and inspired by the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, and it's focused on rare disease, cancer and infection. And I'll show you in, in little bites how we've managed the program so far, also describe to you what we're planning to do in the future and uh, admit to some mistakes we suggest you don't make yourselves. So although it's 100,000 genomes, because we spend genomes on sequencing the tumour and compare that to the normal genome uh, in cancer, it reaches about 80,000 people uh, based on current enrolment. And that's uh, 21 petabytes of data today. And we had to create an infrastructure to do this. So we persuaded the National Health Service to commission NHS Genomic Medicine Centres to make sure that the legacy would have centres of excellence that could deliver such a programme as a transformative healthcare service across our nation. And that involves about 85 NHS organisations and each week about 1,500 frontline staff work on this. And that's again very important about expanding this into not a concentrated group of people just inside Genomics England, but an entire health system enabled to do this at scale. And we've invited 3,000 of you from around the world, you self-nominated and self-organised into collaborative domains as a research collaboration that Augusto referred to earlier. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a brief status slide, elements of which you've seen already from Augusto. And uh, this is where we are today. So we have over 102,000 samples in our possession, uh, 87,000 whole genomes. And you can see as you move towards the right how we have migrated that uh, towards reports returned. And Augusto dealt with why that's been challenging this morning, so I won't repeat it. But what I will share with you is that for potentially 25%, one in four of the participants, we are getting a potential answer for why they're like they are in rare disease. And in cancer, we can see potentially actionable findings in about half the cancer patients' genomes that could allow them to enroll in a clinical trial or could allow them to receive a medicine that's available for their cancer targeted to the genomic architecture of that tumour. And in our research environment, where we're hoping you will work, we currently have 1,600 researchers who are eligible to go in and work on the data, and they've got 55,000 genomes and clinical data on about 71,000 people. And that clinical data is very rich. It's about 4.4 million data points, and it will enrich further later today. And we've got a partnership with industry of about 70 different companies we're working with in different ways to try and enhance the offering for healthcare in the future. So briefly, to share with you where we are in rare diseases, we obviously want this to transform the health system. And so we empower clinicians and academics, uh, like some of you here, to enroll uh, patients to nominate disorders. And the simple feature was they had to have a likely uh, Mendelian architecture and probably uh, a single gene architecture. And so over 1,200 disorders have been entered in the program to date. We just stopped collecting rare disease at the end of September. And uh, we, all of the people have standardized phenotyping criteria using the human phenotype ontology. And this is a deliberate uh, use of this standard uh, as we use for other health data, SNOMED CT. This is so uh, my data can speak to your data somewhere else in the world and if we use data commons we can have a proper analysis across data sets which will be vital to extracting the full value for patients from these data. 
So as I've mentioned today, we're achieving about a 25% potential action in the clinic. Here's the difference the family structure makes. So you can see if you've got a singleton, it does a single individual, usually in disorder of late onset, it does impede your ability to make a diagnosis and that more complex family structures help you to make a diagnosis and that won't surprise many of you here. Equally so, uh, this is just a slide for intellectual disability. This is uh, diagnoses by number of human phenotype ontology terms, and you can see the richer the clinical annotation, the better the chance we can focus the search. Uh, and uh, we have automated uh, use of these HPO terms to assign the panels. So there's automatic software that looks at the HPO terms and says which panels we'll focus in on. And now this month, Augusto's brought live uh, simple tandem repeats and CNVs in the report and so there's a more comprehensive picture of the genome outside the coding region. So this is one case that we uh, have very recently solved and I put this in because this is an example of how the genome can uh, reprioritize a diagnosis. So this is a five-year-old who had unexplained anemia, developmental delay, short stature and constipation and been entered the, into the program as somebody with diamond black fan anemia, a disorder with limited lifespan and uh, risk of cancer. But it turned out that because that uh, child had some developmental delay, the intellectual disability panel revealed a tier one, i.e. pathogenic mutation in the thyroid hormone receptor alpha. And this is an example of how a diagnosis is taken from one thing that a clinician thinks and reprioritized because of the richness of the data. So in, in clinical medicine, we like patterns and we like to push people into patterns of diagnosis and sometimes that's not right and this is an example of how the genome helped us solve that case and this is partly treatable not fully but partly treatable by thyroid hormone and it should be that his growth will at least accelerate somewhat and he will have reduced constipation and improved anemia so this is cancer this is really 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 tough to do and this is why I'm sharing this with you and I'm going to focus a little bit on cancer for precisely that reason because some of you may be starting out in that area one thing that we found is we could not get a decent genome product with formalin fixed tissue. Uh, the problem is seen there in this uh, slide. It's the same patient on the left and the right. It's a prostate cancer, biopsies from that prostate cancer, whole genome sequence. On the left, that's fresh tissue. On the right, it looks like a child has got a crayon and scribbled in the middle. That's spurious structural variants that are occurring due to formalin cross-linking. So that is not a product for healthcare that is a potential product for healthcare. And you can see even better in the metrics at the bottom why we shouldn't do this. Look at the percentage AT loss on the left there for formal and fixation. And this, you look at the spurious numbers of SNVs that you're seeing there. So in essence, what I'm sharing with you is that we couldn't get that to work. So we bought live 300 pathways in the NHS for fresh tissue acquisition, uh, which is still there today. And also other methods like biopsy, shake and biopsy and other things that have enhanced the program. And we've now got a very good cancer program uh, and product and this is what we think is potentially actionable so we look at 136 potentially actionable genes today and this is on 5,700 people and what you can see is that in dark blue the small variants which are in clearly actionable genes and in lighter blue those in potentially actionable genes and that's about 50 percent of the patients where we can point them in the direction of a drug trial and I'll show you in a moment how we're also using that information. This is a uh, tiling tumor mutational burden in SMVs per megabase up the side and by cancer along the bottom. And what you can see if you look up at the colorectal line there is you can see a population of colorectal can cancer patients who are hypermutated or ultra hypermutated. These are people who are telling you and I that they're very likely to recur, they've got nasty cancers, and perhaps they should be given more advanced immunotherapies earlier in their care. So the genome can tell us something about what we should do in the clinic today. And it, we are using this to get people to trials, and I'll show you an example. And this is uh, one of the areas I think we will use genomes to focus in on cancer care, which is the proportion of high tumor mutational bur burden. Uh, and this, this, I think, will become an increasing feature of our use in clinical practice. So here's a case where this has changed uh, the care of somebody. This is a lady in the center with the, in the shaded circle uh, who had breast cancer, was not from an at-risk community at all, no family history whatsoever, but in her somatic genome and in her germline, she had a BRCA2 mutation. And that meant that she could get, enter a trial, which she would never have got on the health service under normal care, and receive a laparib. It also has extended import for the family, and I'm sharing with you the family-wide consequences of this genomic testing. Her daughter at the bottom also has a BRCA2 mutation, which she te got tested for because of her mum's cancer. 
and she is considering uh, intensive breast screening and possibly breast reducing surgery. Her mother, who had the breast cancer, is now completed chemotherapy and is going to go forward for a nephrectomy because of the link to uh, ovarian cancer. And on the right, the men there are at increased risk, if they possess BRCA2, of prostate cancer. So this is an example about how a single result engaged for a single person can have family-wide consequences and actually lead to a treatment prioritization that they wouldn't have got from routine health care. So we're now using the data to actually spot where the patients are that can be enrolled in trials. So this is a, a, a trial that we've got running in lung cancer called the Lung Matrix Trial. And the, each of those dots are peoples around the genomic medicine centers that we've identified across 122 lung cancer patients who could be eligible for this trial. So what we're trying to do now is report that back for everybody, but also try to start highlighting these individuals to their local clinicians as eligible for the trial. We don't break the de-identification of the data in doing that because they're the clinicians looking after the patients. So it's okay to tell them that there's a trial opportunity. So this was published in the New England Journal just over a week ago now, and this is our work with the Cryptic Consortium on 10,000 TB strains uh, with multidrug resistance. And so you can sequence the TB organism and get a diagnosis, and in another day you can profile the resistance elements in that organism, such that people can now have precision TB care. Uh, as you see there. We contributed 3,000 variants, and now in our NHS there is a routine uh, screening of about 1,000 TB organisms a month in the NHS for patient care. So uh, what have we done to transform healthcare? Well, we're bringing pharmacogenomic testing live in the NHS, and what we're doing at the moment is looking at a number of gene drug pairs, uh, and that is, will come live from April 2019, so everyone who has a whole genome will receive a pharmacogenomic report on a certain number of uh, genetic uh, drug, gene drug pairs. We will also have panels live in the NHS for anyone with a suspected adverse reaction due to uh, pharmacogenomics, and that will revolutionize our service. So this is an example from our whole genomes, about 6,000 or so, of how we can detect with CYP2C19 uh, poor metabolizers who should not receive clopidogrel because they're not going to get any benefit from it because clopidogrel is a prodrug, so it has to be activated in your body. And the poor metabolizers seen at the bottom, they should not get clopidogrel for their acute coronary syndrome. So once people are carrying these reports around, they'll be able to show doctors. And what we will look at doing, we haven't done it and we haven't started thinking about it, is how we can make that more user-friendly and portable so it can be carried into every clinical consult. The other thing we've done is in partnership with the National Health Service, the team at Genomics England have uh, looked at 300,000 tests deployed across our health system, upgraded 25% of them, and uh, whole genome sequencing will go live from the 1st of January in about 24 rare diseases and four cancers. And every year this will be reviewed. This is a national test directory. And this is the organization of the genomic service. Genomic medicine centers and national laboratories will be run by the NHS. Genomics England will run the national database for all genomic testing, which will be concentrated in one data set. Uh, we will also manage the whole genome sequencing provider, its clinical interpretation, and industry, academic, and international partnerships such as this. And these are the number of whole genomes the NHS is thinking about um, sequencing. It probably will be less than one seventy. It will be around 70,000, I suspect, in the next two years. But that's in a direct healthcare system available to clinicians and people like yourselves. So what about the future? Well, the future is extremely bright as of this week. Um, we've got excellent partnerships with France Genomic, who you'll hear about from Anne in a moment, with uh, Cathy and the team in Australia, uh, and also with British Columbia. And we've commissioned a lab to do some work on multi-omics, long reads, CFT DNA, and transcriptomics. And we're, keen, we're very enthusiastic about this meeting. And I congratulate you, you and Peter and Angela and Ashley, on massive progress with this organization towards, I think, really meaningful standards we can adopt. We're also going to be sequencing more cancer patients because we haven't done the job there yet with the life sciences strategy. So we're working in global alliance on these projects with various of you, and actually it's a fantastic collaboration. We're delighted to be doing it, and where we can, we'll adopt as many of the standards as are relevant, and we can afford to do so. And therefore, you could see us as partners to pilot things and test things with. But today, we're very excited because this week, this man, who you'll never have heard of, who is our Secretary of State for Health, stood up and made this announcement. So he's announced that there'll be one million whole genomes done for in the NHS and with the UK Biobank being sequenced by whole genome sequencing. 
and uh, it, he's pledged this is the third uh, successive government round of spending where there has been a, a commitment in principle to support genomics uh, at least um, as an announcement and this is the really important bit which is the ambition to sequence five million genomes in the UK so just when I thought I was going to sit down and put my feet up it looks like we've got a bit of a job to do in genomics England <laughs> so uh, this is where we've got to we, we were created to transform the NHS. We've invited you in to do research on our research platform. We've created a national genomic medicine service with the NHS in England, which allows equitable care for 55 million people. We've got standardized operating processes, but we look forward where possible to adopting the standards produced by this group. And your work is going to be very, very, very important to making a standard product that will be usable in healthcare. And we're going to concentrate all genomic tests, whatever they are, in one single national database, and everybody who undergoes a clinical test for genomics will be offered consent for a search in the whole UK and we'll concentrate that there and that will be available for what I think is the most important feature of my talk which is that the future of this is a coalition of global intellects it is not the province of one nation it what we do here in this room and take back to our workplaces across the world will determine how fast patients get the benefit of this I'd like to thank the members of our team at Genomics England some of whom are here and you'll have met over the last few days, uh, the various nations that have helped us with this, Sue Hill particularly and NHS England who couldn't be here today, and these are the participants who want you to see them because they're delighted to be part of the programme and many of them have not yet received a diagnosis. If you want to know more, do get in touch. It's been a real privilege to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Over to you. Do you do questions or not? No questions.